Welcome back to another episode of the CSK8 podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. Each week of this podcast is either an episode with a guest or multiple guests or a solo episode where I unpack some scholarship in relation to computer science education. This week's particular episode is a continuation of a little mini series that I'm doing on curriculum, especially in relation to integration. So episode 121 discussed a paper that I wrote on the intersections of popular musicianship and computer science practices. But on episode 123, I talked about some different types of integration styles and their implications in computer science education. And then episode 125 that released last week, I discussed different images of curriculum. And then this week, I'm gonna read another little excerpt from another chapter by William H. Schubert. And the title for that excerpt is Contemporary Venues of Curriculum Inquiry, and is found in the Curriculum Inquiry chapter in the Sage Handbook of Curriculum and Instruction in 2008. All right, so here's an introduction to this particular chapter. Quote, in this chapter, curriculum inquiry is conceived as thought, study, and interpretation used to understand curriculum, which is characterized as experiential journeys that shape perspectives, dispositions, skills, and knowledge by which we live. Curriculum inquiry inevitably must consider a multitude of questions that have perplexed educators throughout history. For example, what is worthwhile, why, where, when, how, and for whose benefit, end quote. It's from page 399. Now, I'm gonna be focusing primarily on the excerpt that I mentioned. However, if you wanna read the entire chapter, I include a link to it in the show notes so you can check it out, which you can find at jaredoleary.com or by simply clicking the link in the app that you're listening to this on. You also notice in the description that I mentioned that this podcast is powered by Boot Up, which is the nonprofit organization that I work for, where I create 100% free elementary coding curriculum, which you can find at bootuppd.org or by clicking the link in the app that you're listening to this on. Now, if I were to summarize this particular excerpt into a single sentence, I'd say that this excerpt describes different venues or types of curriculum that educators and education researchers should consider. Now, I think this is important for classroom educators in particular, but it's really important for researchers to think about what are they actually researching when it comes to curriculum? Because there are many different types of curriculum or lenses through which we can assess teaching, learning, etc. And by assess, I mean to like broadly understand, not just like evaluate. Now, here's a quote from page 400 that I think is interesting to consider. Quote, Today's curriculum scholarship seeks complicated understandings and multiple meanings of personal and public identity, modes of human association, and environmental relationships in many societal venues, as well as the nature and effectiveness curriculum delivery in schools, the dominant interest of past curriculum inquiry. Such inquiry often includes complex integrations of salient factors that shape human lives and outlooks, culture, language, socioeconomic class, race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, body and appearance, religion or belief, mass media, ecology, globalization, imperialism, and more. These factors are increasingly perceived as curricula in their own right, not just forces that inhibit or facilitate curriculum for schools, end quote. All right, so why is that important? So as I mentioned in the previous episodes that I mentioned at the start of this podcast, when you are conceiving of computer science curriculum, or an integrated version of computer science curriculum, you really need to be able to sit down with your colleagues, stakeholders, etc., to figure out, well, one, what do you conceive of as integration? Because there are many different ways of integrating. See the episode titled The Subservient, Co-Equal, Effective, and Social Integration Styles and Their Implications for CS Education or Computer Science to learn more about that. But then see the episode last week titled Images of Curriculum, which mentions that there are many images or characterizations of what we might even consider to be a curriculum. Like what is the intent or rationale or purpose behind it? But this week we're going to dive into even more perspectives related to curriculum. Because it's important for us to consider that even when speaking with a colleague, when we use the word curriculum, it has many different associations or meanings or baggage tied to it that we need to consider. And it might be helpful when trying to figure out your computer science curriculum or program or how you're going to integrate computer science, how all these terms actually are perceived and intersect and interact with each other when engaging in dialogue with different people. Here's a quote from page 401 that kind of enhances what I was just saying. So quote, To inquire deeply into curricular phenomenon is a daunting task as depicted in a curriculum matrix developed by Fauché. Fauché portrays three-dimensional interactions among 25 variables, purpose, intellectual, emotional, social, physical, aesthetic, transcendent, substance, mathematics, science, history, or social studies, language and literacy, writing and composition, foreign languages, arts, vocational and technical, co-curriculum, school culture, and practice, 
evaluation, cost, governance, circumstance, when, how, why, what, who. To even approximate understanding of such complex interactions requires investigation of their origins within both the context of schooling and a host of non-school realms from which they emanate. Policymakers from governmental and corporate circles, however, have not wanted to deal with such complexities and preferred business-like solutions encapsulated in a goals implementation evaluation test model, end quote. I would argue that researchers also tend to not want to look at those interactions and intersections between those different variables. Often we simply look at an intervention and look at the curriculum itself, not necessarily how it was taught, who it was taught by, who it was taught to, where this occurred, when it occurred, what was occurring outside of school, how did different funds and support impact what was taught. Instead, what it's just focused on is the curriculum itself, and a pre and post, etc. But as we'll soon find out, there's so much more that we can learn in terms of curriculum. All right, so I'm gonna skip a decent portion of this particular chapter and just focus on the section that starts in 407, Contemporary Venues of Curriculum Inquiry. If you're interested in more of like a history or like a broader understanding from like a kaleidoscopic view of curriculum discourse, check out the pages that I'm skipping. Again, I link to it in the show notes. Well, let's talk specifically about contemporary venues of curriculum inquiry. So the first one is titled Intended Curriculum. So Schubert describes the intended curriculum as, quote, explicit goals to shape the outlooks and capacities, end quote. That's from page 407. So as somebody who's developed curriculum full-time for a few years now, the content that I create is the intended curriculum. It's what I'm conceiving in my head and going, hmm, this is what I really like students, teachers, Etc. to be able to walk away with, whether it's the big understandings or concepts and practices like the, from the K-12 framework or standards, or in my case, it'd be more of like a passion for wanting to learn more about CS and apply it in their lives. That's what I intend through the content that I create. And that's what researchers tend to focus on is what was intended to be learned. And that kind of assessment is usually done through like a Tylerian lens or Tyler rationale may have heard it from Ralph Tyler in the 40s, is in the 1940s, wrote some ideas in terms of like what curriculum or schooling could look like. And those ideas have kind of been one of the dominant paradigms or perspectives that has shaped educational discourse and what just generally occurs within a classroom context in particular. Now, interestingly, Tyler wrote about how it's not just the sequence of learning, but there are many factors that go into education and learning that we need to consider. But Schubert points out that this is often neglected. There is an overemphasis on the activities or the content itself, and not enough emphasis on the learning experiences. Even though Tyler recommended, hey, we need to focus on this. And what's also neglected is a discussion on the, quote, interaction of the learner and external conditions in the environment, end quote. It's from page 407 and 408. Now, these nuances and these interactions are often lost to what Schubert describes as recipes. Quote, hence only the shell of Tyler's message, known as the Tyler rationale, remained in too many central offices of schools, state departments, ministries of education, federal bureaucracies, and corporate headquarters. Left behind was his emphasis on careful attention to context and nuance in student lives, end quote. It's from page 408, which from a perspective of somebody who has presented and published, it is really interesting what people take away from what you say. And it sounds like in this case, even though Tyler emphasized nuances within education, people took away the focus on content. And Schubert argues that this focus on content is often perpetuated by professional organizations, publications, for school administrators, as well as government and corporate education offices. And so it's done in a how-to or recipe format in order to meet some kind of a mandate of government or corporate entities, whether it's, hey, we're donating money if you do A, B, or C, or hey, if you wanna be accredited, you need to do X, Y, or Z. And because teachers have so many things to learn and do outside of just teaching, so many responsibilities and whatnot, the attendant curriculum that is presented as recipes or how-tos is trying to make the lives of teachers easier. But depending on what kind of curricular rationale or characterization, it can unknowingly shape the learning that goes on in the classroom. Check out the episode from last week to learn a little bit more about that. Now, interestingly, Schubert mentions that there are curriculum scholars, and leaders who are trying to get back to what was omitted from the Tyler rationale in terms of considering many different factors and resisting these external mandates imposed by people who are not experts within the field of education. For example, corporate influence, issuing out mandates 
in order to receive funding for devices or PD or whatever. Schubert notes that, quote, even though such sources intend to resist corporate-minded efficiency and enrich considerations, resultant inquiry for planning is often streamlined and separated from grassroots environments of teachers, students, parents, and community, end quote, from page 408. Now, again, this really reminds me of the rhizomatic learning discussion that I mentioned last week with Catherine Bornhorst, Katie Henry, and John Stapleton. It's a fantastic panel discussion that we have on rhizomatic learning and kind of talks about these individualized and grassroots co-development of learning experiences. So if you want to learn more about that, highly recommend checking that out and learning more about rhizomatic learning. All right, so if the intended curriculum is like the thing that a curriculum developer or organization or company or whatever intends for people to learn or to do or engage with, a layer down from that is called the taught curriculum. So the taught curriculum is what teachers actually teach from the intended curriculum. Sometimes teachers will deviate just by monitoring and adjusting. Sometimes teachers will look at a curriculum and go, hmm, that's interesting, but I'd prefer to talk about A instead of B. Or the kids that I work with might not be interested in that particular topic, so how could I reframe these concepts and practices in a topic that they would be interested in? So when educational researchers are investigating a curriculum, like with a pre and a post, to see, well, how well does this teach computer science concepts and practices, standards, or computational thinking? or computational literacies. What's often omitted from those publications and those discussions is, okay, well, how did the intended curriculum, what was designed and developed, how did that differ from what was actually taught? What was changed? Or was there a script and teachers were reading verbatim? Likely not. So we need to consider differences in how people teach things from how it was intended to be taught. Now what is taught is different from the experience curriculum. So here's a quote from page 408 and 409. Quote, partially through Dewey's emphasis on experience, authors of synoptic text on curriculum development have hailed curriculum as an experiential process. Caswell and Campbell define curriculum as all the experiences children have under the guidance of teachers. And B. Smith Stanley and Shores call curriculum a sequence of potential experiences for the purpose of disciplining children and youth in group ways of thinking and acting. The curriculum is always, in every society, a reflection of what people think, feel, believe, and do. The enacted curriculum includes the intended and taught. Moreover, its complexity involves a combined impact of all contributors, teachers, students, parents, policymakers, subject matter, and milieus within schools. The experienced curriculum expands attention to thoughts, meanings, and feelings of students as they encounter it." End quote. Okay, so now in our third layer, we have the intended curriculum, which is like what's designed or developed. We have the taught curriculum, which is like the variations and deviations that a teacher chooses to make or unintentionally or willingly from the intended curriculum. But then what is experienced by a student might be different in terms of how did their learning experience differ from their peers and from what was taught or intended. But then there's another layer deeper that is the embodied curriculum. So the embodied curriculum might be conceived of as like, well, what do students walk away with? What do they take away and hold on to? And oftentimes that's not necessarily the concepts and practices that were supposed to be emphasized or the standards that were written up on the board of here's your intended learning outcome. What a student actually walks away from is the embodied curriculum, which is a result from what they experienced, which is a result from what was taught which is a result from what was intended to be taught. However, there's another type of venue to consider when it comes to curriculum, and that is hidden curriculum. So here's a quote from page 404. Quote, The idea that the structures of schooling teach much that is not included in the official curriculum is referred to by the term hidden curriculum. End quote. So a little bit further down on page 404, Schubert mentions that educators should, quote, look at hidden consequences of life in classrooms and shaping outlooks and attitudes. He showed that living in a crowd of age mates, learning to defer gratification, and learning one's place in a variety of pecking orders constitute indelible consequences of schooling, perhaps more powerful than intended subject matter, end quote. And a little bit further down, the author mentions a particular study that explored the, quote, hidden curricular messages about divergent meanings of success conveyed to students of different school, different social classes. She found that lower class students are taught to follow rules, middle class students learn to give right answers, while professional class students are allowed to be creative as long as they do not challenge executive elites. And the latter learn that schools bestow upon them valuable credentials of the Ivy League variety, that combine with their powerful connections and financial wherewithal to seal and deliver the continued dominance of their families. 
end quote. So I wanna expand upon this idea of a hidden curriculum and specifically like the difference in class and what is taught. So as an example, one time I had a conversation with somebody who is describing a curriculum in a lower socioeconomic location. And the curriculum was very verbatim in terms of had worksheets where there were right and wrong answers. You had to follow a sequence of steps and everybody would end up with the same result in that. And this was for Scratch, which is intended to be expressive and creative and open. But what they were describing was a very closed structure. Everybody had to follow the rules, basically. The hidden curriculum of this aligns with what Schubert was just describing. They were using, unknowingly, I'm assuming, a deficit framing that urban kids in particular could not engage in creative expression. First, they need to learn how to follow the rules. Then maybe after they've kind of proven themselves, then maybe they can actually express themselves. That hidden curriculum or deficit framing of a hidden curriculum in particular is highly problematic and is something that we need to consider. What are the things that are not overtly taught through the intended curriculum, but are nevertheless embodied through the hidden curriculum. And these forms of curriculum differ from what Schubert describes as the tested curriculum. So here's a couple of questions that Schubert asks from page 410, quote, what is tested and why? Who benefits from the testing? How does testing sort society into a variety of levels of opportunity, end quote. That last question in particular is really something to sit with. How does testing sort society into a variety of levels of opportunity? When we think of high stakes testing, it's high stakes because we know that if you don't pass this test, that has an impact on what doors are open or closed for you down the road. It's almost like we're playing an educational roguelike where if you make one mistake, it can have a cascading series of barriers or challenges that you would then have to overcome if you didn't make that mistake. For example, just not doing well on SATs or something. How will that impact whether or not you get into a college? And maybe the reason why you didn't do well in the SATs has absolutely nothing to do with your preparedness. Maybe you just had a death in the family. But college admissions don't know that. They just see the score. And Schubert points out that it tends to be policymakers who have this overemphasis on test scores as they tend to have like a business mindset in terms of, well, this is the profit margin of curricular success. This curriculum is great because students scored this way on this thing. But again, that's just looking at the intended curriculum, not necessarily what is taught or what is embodied and experienced. So policymakers in some states are now going, well, we should have performance pay. So that way we can also evaluate what is taught, what is experienced, what is embodied. You could do that, but that gets into another category that Schubert mentions called the null curriculum. Here's a quote from page 410. Quote, this term refers to that which is minimized or excluded due to priority and budget, capacities for art, philosophy, psychology, health, commitment, imagination, empathy, dedication, resourcefulness, spirituality, kindness, integrity, and lifelong learning are often touted as valuable. Yet, widely used achievement tests measure none of them, so they are given short shrift or no emphasis at all, especially in social contexts where students receive low scores due to poverty, racism, and oppression. Thus, one could argue that the testing industry is built upon a network of assumptions about inquiry that creates methodologies of control or colonization, thereby creating docile acceptance of the sorting machine, end quote. Going back to that little story that I mentioned of the person talking about, well, these urban students are unable to engage in creative uses of scratch. They need to just follow the steps. Another thing that I hear is what Schubert just described as an old curriculum is all of these other things that are often highly valued and whatnot. Those things are often left out in those context because there's such an emphasis on following rules and coming up with the same solutions rather than actually engaging in a more holistic approach to learning that goes beyond just simply standards, concepts, and practices or content knowledge and instead focuses on other areas of life. Like that list that Schubert mentioned. So the capacities for art, philosophy, psychology, health, commitment, imagination, empathy, dedication, resourcefulness, spirituality, kindness, integrity, and lifelong learning. So few of those are actually a part of intended curricula, which means they're likely not part of what is taught or what is experienced, and then therefore what is embodied. And most of those certainly are not a part of the tested curriculum. So oftentimes what is omitted from a curriculum can be even more important than what is actually included included in the intended curriculum. But that being said, having been a classroom educator and now curriculum developer and whatnot, I'm fully aware that you don't have enough time in the day for everything. You have to make design decisions, essentially, especially if you're trying to sell a curriculum to a large group of kids, which again goes back to, well, you don't have to do that. Learn more in that Rhizomatic Learning podcast that I mentioned with Katie, Catherine, and John. And there's a link to that in the show notes. All right, so one more area 
that Schubert mentions is the outside curriculum. So this is the curriculum that occurs outside of schools, whether it be through their community, families, homes, peer groups, workplaces, or even just like hobbies and avocations and whatnot. Think of like Papert or Stebbins in their discussions on constructionism and serious leisure. These are all areas of curriculum that can profoundly shape our understandings of life or concepts or domains or whatever. And within these venues outside of school, they all have their own different intended, taught, embodied, hidden, and tested in all dimensions that relate to these different curricula. So if we're an educational researcher, yes, we should maybe look into the intended versus the taught versus what's experienced or embodied, as well as the hidden, tested, and null curricula. But it's also useful to look at, well, what is learned or experienced outside of schools? How might that have an impact on what's going on inside of schools? And one way you can actually explore this and connect with this in the class is through Curer, which the author describes in the episode that I released last week with more detail. So check out that one if you're interested in it. Curer has profoundly shaped my own understanding of what I designed for boot up, and then how I collaboratively designed individualized learning experiences with kids that I worked with in the classroom. All right, now I wanna actually read a couple of paragraphs from the close of this particular chapter. So the section is titled Questions for Continued Curriculum Inquiry. And there's so many good questions in here, which is why I wanna read all of them for you. This is from page 412. Quote, the expansion of curriculum away from school into multiple spheres of life has made many scholars uneasy. Some have assumed that this diminishes the democratic project that we have historically seen as the purpose of schools. What, however, if schools have become so fully institutionalized to serve affluence that the democratic project has been transformed into preparation for autocracy or oligarchy of a new corporate world. In such a case, should not the context that shape us become curricular content worthy of study? What if school is a mere decoy for education of the Dewey and democratic tradition? What if engagement in educational experience that searches for meaning and direction opposes the intended curriculum of developing loyal followers? Are we in an area in which the choice is, as Chomsky warns, hegemony or survival? If schools are largely reflections of messages that assert domination by an opulent minority, are they not preventatives to the free pursuit of lifelong learning? What if the structures of schooling are a hidden curriculum that rejects personal and democratic construction of meaning and direction? What if dominant goals, curriculum materials, and tests are packages delivered unwittingly by minions who perpetuate the power of a globalized opulent minority? Is it not the responsibility of those concerned with curriculum to find the best places to keep alive basic curriculum questions? What has shaped us? How do we become what we are? What is worth being and doing? How do we want to become and how can we shape the journey to go there? How can we live together without continuing to destroy this planetary environment? For those involved in curriculum inquiry, I ask, how can we overcome the powerful impediments to pursue such questions? How can curriculum inquiry enable public discourse, including that of children and youths, to be centered on such questions? End quote. Some fantastic questions to think through. Now, normally I like to end with like sharing some of my own lingering thoughts and questions and whatnot. I've kind of been embedding that throughout. What I'm going to do instead is just kind of give a quick example of each of these different venues of curriculum inquiry. Okay, so zooming out again, and I'll use boot up's curriculum like as an example. So the lessons that I have written out for like Scratch and Scratch Junior are the intended curriculum. I went into it going, I want kids to be able to express themselves. I want their interest to drive their learning. I want them to find a way to connect concepts, practices, understandings of computer science education with things they are already passionate about. So that way they can hopefully develop a passion for computer science. That's what I intend. However, I have seen some people teach the lessons that I've created that are like designed to be springboards as a model, not a mandate. But what I've instead seen, the taught curriculum, where some teachers will go in and be like, okay, we're all going to create the exact same thing. Everybody's going to recreate Jared's project exactly the way that Jared created it. That taught curriculum is very different than what I intended. And what students experience in that might differ for each of them. Some of them might be working in a group. Some of them might be working individually. Those have a big impact on how they experience those particular projects that I designed, which has an impact on what they embody in terms of what do they walk away with? What do they learn? All of these are also shaped by hidden curricula that I have unknowingly or intentionally designed into it. For example, in a Scratch Junior project that has mixed race parents with jobs that are not typically associated with those genders, that is a hidden curricula that I intentionally designed into the curriculum. And then also hidden curricula of the social milieu. So the social context 
such as classroom environment, how kids and adults collaborate and communicate with each other. And then depending on what is tested or assessed, you want to go with that. Like maybe there's just a project rubric. Hey, when you turn in this project, make sure it has a variable, make sure it has two conditionals and like four different event structures or something. That tested curriculum has a profound impact on what students will experience and embody because they tend to focus on that rather than the things that are not tested or assessed. But then everything within that that is left out of those experiences, that's the null curriculum. And then beyond all of that that went on in the classroom context, the outside curriculum. Maybe somebody, instead of using boot up's curriculum, maybe they went with code.org on their own at home. Or maybe they just went on YouTube and watched Griff Patch or something, create something cool in Scratch. And they're like, I want to do that too. All of these different types of curriculum or venues for curriculum have a profound impact on teaching and learning, which leads me to a question that I have. If you were to analyze your experiences as both a teacher or a student of computer science education, how have the various curriculum venues impacted your understanding of computer science education? And then building off of what I mentioned last week, how do these venues intersect or interact with the images or characterizations of curriculum that I previously discussed? If you actually sit down and take the time to really think about these different images, characterizations, venues of curriculum, in relation to the different types of integration, this can lead to a very rich reflection and discussion with colleagues about what do we actually want from our computer science curriculum and how do our integration goals align with our vision or rationales for computer science. And maybe it doesn't. Maybe one of the things that you'll find is, you know what, integration, while it might save time, it actually is a disservice to the concepts, practices, understandings we want students to walk away with. Instead, we wanna have a standalone class that specifically dives deep into computer science, concepts, practices, standards, whatever, and then we can embed those understandings into other subject areas. Or maybe you'll find, no, we just wanna focus on integrating into math and math only. And that's really up to you. My hope is that these podcasts spark discussion or thought or reflection or inquiry. And if it did, I hope you consider sharing with somebody else or leaving a review on whatever app that you're listening to this on. It just helps more people find it. Thank you for joining me in this nerdy discussion around curriculum. If you're not a fan of curricula and curricular discourse and scholarship, my apologies for the last several episodes that have kind of talked about it, but hopefully it was of interest to you. It certainly is for me, but I know I'm a curriculum nerd. Stay tuned next week for another episode. And until then, I hope you're all staying safe and are having a wonderful week.